Good design is good business and better for the planet. That is the title of our next guest presentation, Matthew Candy. He is Global Managing Partner, IBM IX. And Matt is the Global Managing uh, Partner for that company, which is the Customer and Experience Transformation Unit within IBM Services. And it is a team that helps clients reinvent their business by design. So um, thank you, first of all, for supporting this room named uh, Next and Innovation. And we are looking forward to listening to you, Matthew. Let's start. So good morning, everybody. Look, and thank you so much for inviting me to join you today, um, albeit virtually. Um, but my name, as Susanna said, is Matt Candy. And so I'm the global managing partner for IBM IX. And we're the business design and customer experience transformation arm within IBM services. Now, at IBM, um, we believe in progress and that the application of intelligence, reason and science can improve business, society and the human condition. And in IBM IX, I'm responsible for our team of over 17,000 creators and makers across a global network of over 57 studios. And we've got one purpose, and that is to be essential. Now, our team operates at the intersection of strategy, creativity, and technology to help our clients transform experiences for their customers, for their citizens, employees, and partners all over the world and across industries, from cement to theme parks, to banks, to government health departments, and everything in between. Now, we've worked with the Catalonian Health Department on their COVID-19 vaccine rollout. We're working with Cayamar to create the biggest agricultural banking platform in Spain, promoting a more sustainable and collaborative agribusiness model. We've worked with the Audi Group to help grow their digital sales of cars, even during the pandemic when their retail forecourts were closed. And we do this by partnering with some of the biggest technology organizations in the industry, such as Salesforce, Adobe, to bring the very best solutions and outcomes to our clients' greatest challenge, which is tomorrow. Now, tomorrow is an unknown. And when business and society face uncertainty, innovation and new ways of working are required like never before. And technology alone is not enough. And such a shift it requires new thinking, using data and AI powered platforms to infuse incredible insight and intelligence into all customer experiences and digital touch points. And the goal is really simple, friction out, intelligence in. And so today, I wanna to provoke all of you to think about this opportunity and how we achieve it, but in such a way that future proofs not only your organization, but also the planet. And so for the next 25 minutes, I'm going to share with you some thoughts on how. I'm going to share our own IBM transformation story. 
I'm going to share about the role design has played in that transformation. And as we look to the future, I want to share with you how I believe design can be the lever to shepherd the next wave of digital transformation in a responsible and sustainable way. Now, I warn you, it's going to involve some audience participation. So you're going to need some sheets of paper and a pen nearby to do some drawing. So let me start by sharing our own IBM transformation story. Now, we're 110 years old. And the IBM of today is a very different place to that of 1911. And there's no denying our shift from products to services and beyond was necessary for IBM's survival. Because to have remained in the meat and cheese slicing business as we were 110 years ago, or to have focused all of our efforts on the hardware and PC business, it may have led to short-term profitability in one area, but we certainly wouldn't have made it to our 110th year. Because to survive this long as an organization, you have to change, to move forward, and to constantly reinvent. Now, in the early days of modern computing, when IBM was inventing virtualization and backward compatibility, IBM's leaders were also innovating by adopting design as an important part of how they operated. And in 1956, our then chairman, Thomas J. Watson, pioneered and established IBM's corporate design program, one of the first the world had seen bringing in talents such as Elliot Noyes, Paul Rand, Ray and Charles Eames, all dedicated to making things better, not just different. Now, Watson believed that good design is good business, right? It was a battle cry for the place of design in business operations. And today, that battle cry needs to be even louder. Design drives lasting change for every company in every industry. And it drives a lasting change in mindset, a change in approach to problem solving and a change in ways of working centered around creating better outcomes for the humans that you serve, your customers, your employees, your business partners. Now, to understand how IBM did this, fast forward to 2012. So our newly appointed CEO and chairman, Ginny Rometty, set about changing how we did things in IBM. And she recognized the need for a fundamental culture shift. Now, Ginny wanted to link back to our past heritage and reignite Watson's beliefs around design, making it the central pillar to her strategy and reinvention of IBM. And she challenged her team to create a sustainable culture of design and design thinking in IBM. Now, that challenge led to the formation of a new business unit at IBM called IBM Design, charged with driving design across all elements of the IBM organization. And so on the topic of design, right, it's time for a bit of audience participation. Very difficult when I can't see any of you, but we're going to give it a go. So if you can take a piece of paper and a pen and a pencil, right, I'd like you on that piece of paper to design a vase. OK, so I, I'm going to give you a few, you know, 30 seconds, but I'd like you to on this piece of paper to draw a picture of a vase. Right. Use your best creative imagination. Uh, you know, it's early on a Monday morning. Um, but I'd like you to have a go at drawing a picture of a vase on that paper. Okay. Right. So hopefully everybody has got something on a piece of paper in front of them. Um, so if you could put that piece of paper to, to one side, um, I now want all of you to consider this question, right? What does design mean to you? Now, typically when people think of design, they think of examples like these. They think of interior, product, visual, fashion design. But all of these are outcomes of design. And in fact, design is a discipline, right? It's the thinking, the planning, the solving brought together by a diverse set of skills to create these products and services and solutions that work well for people. Now, design with a capital D, it gives us a framework to prioritize our actions from the human's perspective. It gives us our North Star. And it's not just a craft to make things shiny and look good. Design is a craft to disrupt, disrupt and reinvent both the customer and employee experience, an experience that not only makes their lives a little bit easier, but also gives them a service, a tool, or something that allows them to master their environment in some new, unique, and differentiating way. And if you just look at the definition, or if you just jump back a slide, if we just look at the definition of the word design, D sign, the purpose planning or intention behind an action, fact or material object. So design is not the product or service, but rather the intent, 
that sits behind it. So if design is about the intent, then what do we mean by design thinking? Well, exactly that, thinking like a designer. Now, Don Norman, who was a luminary in the field, said design thinking is about determining the real problem, considering a wide range of potential solutions and only then converging on a solution. Now, this approach can and must be applied to all areas of an organization, whether it's finance, procurement, marketing, IT, HR, in order to deliver enterprise wide change. And design thinking welcomes diversity in skills and experience to get to the best human outcome. But how do you infuse this mindset, right, and drive this culture shift at scale? Now, to put this in perspective and to provide a little context, IBM has 380,000 people in 171 countries. So if you put us all in one place, it's an entity about equal to Iceland. And so this idea of culture is key. Right? Oftentimes when we talk about culture, we think of meetups and newsletters, emails, videos, but culture isn't made, it's grown because it isn't about corporate messaging or programs, but it's about how we collectively behave over time. And you're never left without a culture. It fades or thrives. And this can't be left to chance. And there has to be an intent that drives a culture. So we anchored our approach around a very simple formula. This idea that people plus practices plus places is what delivers outcomes. And not just any outcomes, but better, faster, more engaging and delightful outcomes. So let's unpack this a little bit. It starts with the right people. Now we view the team as the atomic unit of work and you've got to bring together diverse, multidisciplinary teams, diversity of skills, diversity of experience, of expertise, diversity of identity. Now in IBM in 2012, we faced a ratio of one to 33 designers to developers and we needed to quadruple our raw capacity design. So we wanted to get to a ratio of one to eight on a, on a development team. Now, software development was just our starting point. And as the journey progressed, we broadened our remit to embedding designers across the whole organization. And so we added two and a half thousand formally trained designers across all areas of the company, HR, procurement, finance, product, marketing, IT, all of those, uh, and in addition to the designers in our services team. Now, if we look at the proportion of formally trained designers at IBM versus the rest of IBM, it's a tiny sliver, 0.42% of 380,000 people. But if we add in the number of design thinkers at IBM, then we've got over 220,000 people in IBM trained, certified, and badged in enterprise design thinking and agile ways of working and applying this in their work. And perhaps the single most important achievement of the program was the creation of a formalized career path for designers. It made them equal with developers or salespeople, project managers, and it showed designers what a 20 year career path would look like, including the ability to become an executive. Now, this idea of every discipline or role applying a designer's mindset has been core to our culture change agenda. Creative excellence is required in every one of our disciplines because design is too important to be left to the designers, right? We needed everybody to think like a designer. Not everybody needs to be a designer. And there's absolutely no doubt that these multidisciplinary teams made up of diverse talent has had an immediate impact, right? Such teams have a better understanding of any given situation. They generate more ideas making them more effective problem solvers. But they need more. They need to collaborate. They need to be empowered. They need to have an organizing principle, a North Star, without which people go off in different directions and it will be chaos. And so that's where design thinking comes in. It's mindset that gives you a starting point. And that starting point is a singular focus on the humans that you serve. So we take this North Star and we return to our formula. And we're going to think about practices. So the ability to seamlessly bring together a set of philosophies, methods and approaches that allow teams to work in a new iterative, agile way. And so IBM's enterprise design thinking brings multidisciplinary teams together to continuously observe their user, to form intent 
and to deliver outcomes at speed and scale through agile working techniques. Real outcomes that solve real problems and improve users' lives. And we've accelerated our adoption of these practices through training, enablement, badging, and certification. Now, in the midst of uncertainty, we need a model for action. And so we call this model the loop, and it's a continuous cycle of observing, reflecting, and making. And it drives us to understand the present and to envisage the future. And it enables us to build on our successes and to learn from our failures along the way. And so when taken to heart, the loop keeps us moving forward, despite the uncertainty the future may hold. And so observe is how we get to know people. We uncover their needs. We test ideas. Reflect is how we build understanding, form intent, commit to decisions. And make is where we explore ideas, prototype possibilities, drive outcomes. And you can go in any order you like. Observe, reflect, then make. Make, reflect, and then observe. But we keep moving through this cycle of continuous improvement until it's time to commit. And the thing about continuous improvement is that you're never done. There's always a better solution just around the corner. Now, we've enhanced these practices to include methods and approaches for designing for AI as we look for a new type of relationship with machines. Now, designing for AI requires new considerations, new ways of thinking for conversational-based interfaces. And when we find ourselves in unfamiliar territory, the best way to begin is by reminding ourselves of the true purpose for any innovation is to improve the quality of human life. And so if we come back to our formula, in addition to people and practices, places are also important. The places and spaces in which our teams come together. And while I'll talk about how important it is for teams to be co-located, we must also look at how the world has changed and how companies have had to rapidly change with it, right? The future is hybrid a mixture of remote and in-person working, but the right tools and technologies can bridge that gap and enable us to work effectively together remotely. Now, this is what our workspaces, um, this is what our workspaces used to look like uh, many years ago. And so now we have places that bring together multidisciplinary teams to make and create. Agile working environments, they're designed to drive collaboration and collapse organizational boundaries. Because co-location is of course not always possible, and we've had to become very proficient and more familiar with remote working using modern tooling and devices to distribute work in locations around the world. And so these are just a few examples of tools which you know many teams are using to work remotely, and I'm sure many of which you're using yourselves every day. But the important thing isn't the tool. It's the principles, the rituals, and the ways of working of the company. And so this combination of our principles of people uh, practices and places deliver great outcomes and outcomes that serve the humans at the center of your business. And we've got examples from across all functions of IBM of where this has been done. For instance, this is the mission of our internal CIO organization and their 12,000 people to improve the work experience for our employees, supported by four strategic focus areas, which started leading with design. Not one part of our organization you know, believes that they're immune to this new mindset and the same applies and should apply to all of you. And so the experts agree. We commissioned Forrester to look at our own transformation in IBM and look at how a number of our clients have also driven design into their organizations at scale. They produced a total economic impact study of enterprise design thinking and the numbers speak for themselves. Two times faster to market, 300% ROI. Now, Harvard Business School have also recently released a case study on IBM's design transformation and adoption of design across the enterprise. So look, let's return to our VARS exercise, or rather your VARS. So earlier you drew a picture of a VARS. So now if you take your paper, piece of paper, taking everything that you've just heard about user-centered outcomes, I'm going to ask you my original question again, but this time with a designer's mindset. So on your piece of paper, just draw and design a better way for people to enjoy flowers at home. Yeah? Design a better way for people to enjoy flowers at home. So your mind should start to go to different places, right? You're starting to think about the, out, the experience that the users are going to have. But you're designing a better way for people to enjoy flowers at home. Okay. 
So hopefully you're getting some very different pictures down on your piece of paper to what you did earlier um, with your vase. Yeah, maybe bifold doors, right? Bringing the garden into the house, um, flower delivery services. Yeah, your mind will have gone to different places as you think about the outcome and the experience that user is going to have. <laughs> so let's keep moving. So, so far I've framed the role and impact design and design thinking can have in delivering user-centered outcomes. But I want you to consider what's next. And as we think to the future, how can we extend this role of design and design thinking to create better, sustainable outcomes, not just for the here and now, but for future generations? And so let's step back and let me ask a question, right? What does charging your phone have to do with a hurricane? Charging your phone with a hurricane. Well, the simple act of plugging in this cord into your phone, something that we all do two to three times a day without fail, actually leads to this. Right. Because the energy to charge your phone is made from processes that wreak havoc on the environment. Now, these processes accelerate global warming, increase pollution and the frequency of hurricane destruction around the world. So this small cord in the hands of millions of people actually has enormous impact on the planet and populations. Just like AI. When you ask your Alexa at home for the weather. Do you actually think about the energy footprint of training that AI, right? Fine tuning one AI model requires a lot of power production, producing emissions 17 times the amount an average American does through one year of their life, 17 times. But you don't really think about this when you charge your phone every night or ask Alexa to play your favorite song, do you? Most of us don't because this impact has been purposely designed into obscurity. It's made invisible to you, the user. And so this is something known as the invisible impact, something we don't necessarily see in our day to day lives, but are responsible for. And designers are far too removed from the consequences of their design decisions. AI technologies have amazing potential to solve some of the biggest problems, but their invisible impact must be taken into account. Because 80 percent of the environmental impacts of a product or a service are locked in at the design phase, 80%. And so for businesses, these impacts lead to losing money, customers, and an advantage in the market. Right? Climate change is expected to cost businesses a total of $1 trillion within the next five years. And 72% of companies recognize that climate change presents serious risks for them. And so designers are in the best possible position to enable this transformation and to create with sustainable intention in mind and have a responsibility to do so. So let me bring to life an example of what I mean by the role design can play in the experience or digital solution to create better outcomes for the planet. So if we could play the video, please. Imagine a smartphone stupid enough to ask you not to charge it. Now, here is why this stupid smartphone is actually really, really smart. Backmarket is the number one marketplace for refurbished smartphones. Our mission, encourage a more sustainable use of mobile devices by changing the way we buy them, but also, for the first time, by changing the way we charge them too. So we created Conscious, a new tool that helps you fight CO2 emissions every time you charge your phone. Most people ignore that charging your phone can be very polluting. Electricity comes from a mix of different sources that changes throughout the day, and some sources have a dramatic impact in terms of carbon footprint. By matching energy providers' data with your localization, Conscious analyzes in real time the sources powering your battery and the carbon emissions of your charge. Then, every time you plug in your device, its predictive algorithm tells you what will be the best time to charge your phone to use greener energy sources. Conscious is available for free and included on all compatible refurbished smartphones sold on the back market website. The full code of our app was uploaded on open source platforms and shared with all major smartphones companies to help them make it a future native feature. After one month, the first 10,000 users already saved 18 tons of unnecessary CO2 emissions. And with 5.5 billion mobile devices on Earth, this is just the beginning.
to look so we think about the impact design and designing with sustainability in mind can have. And so our team have been busy too, right? They've been working to integrate sustainability into our enterprise design thinking methods, enabling you to embed sustainability at the core of any project. So we built new methods, workshop approaches, artifacts for the design thinking process to embed sustainability into it from the start. Now you can't solve what you can't see. Yet organizations are under increasing pressure to take responsibility for the ripple effect of their products and services on the world, which requires seeing further than what's just going on in our users' shoes. And so sustainable design thinking equips us to build solutions that will fit today's urge for more ethical and inclusive designs that will address the, the needs of future generations too. And so more than ever, employees demand that companies become purpose-driven. Introducing sustainable design thinking enables the workforce with an expanded framework that activates sustainability as a cultural mindset, and it empowers them with the tools to build solutions that are both great for people and the planet. So look, so now I'm going to challenge you one last time, right, to take your own design one step further. And so now, as we think about where we are today and where we're heading in the world, if I were to ask you to design a better way for people and future generations to enjoy flowers at home, right? And so on that piece of paper, if you were to start to draw and think and let your mind go, not just to the experience that you're creating for the user, but you're creating a product or a service in such a way that you're allowing not just the people today, but future generations to enjoy flowers at home. Because we've got to think like this now, right? We've got to embed sustainable design upfront in all products and services, because we've got a responsibility to future generations. So hopefully you can play with some of these pictures and these ideas um, later on after the session. So as we wrap up, I want to finish with a story. And a story to make you think more broadly about the power of design and experience and the The children and their families have to go home and come back again at a later date, putting them through all of the stress and trauma again. Now, what Doug had never considered prior to that day was the experience of a child lying in the MRI machine. Right? Children didn't see this sleek design and amazing technology. They just simply saw a scary, loud machine that they're going to have to get inside and lie still and not move in. And so Doug decided that he had to make a change. And so seeking advice, he flew to California to the Stanford D School, the spiritual home of design and where design thinking was born. And here he learned about human centered approaches to design and innovation. He collaborated within cross functional teams with managers and executives from other companies, other industries. And during his time, he experimented and iterated on the ideas of others. And when he left the D school, he continued to practice design thinking and applied these human centered design methods to his work with his team. And he started by observing and gaining empathy for young children at a daycare center. He talked with child life specialists to understand pediatric patients, reached out to others within GE, children's museums and doctors. And so as a result of his design thinking journey, Doug and his team created the adventure series, right? A series of stories that start at home with the child before they ever come to hospital. And once in hospital, that story continues, including stickers and imagery on the MRI machine itself, the walls and the floors of the hospital room. They created scripts for the machine operator to read to the child as they enter the machine. So for example, you're gonna be sailing inside this pirate ship, right? You've got to stay completely still while on the boat so that we don't rock it and get seen by the baddies. And afterwards they get to pick treasure from a treasure chest. Now Doug's great design offered his users the chance to be just a child, not a patient. But that wasn't the only outcome. It approved efficiency in the hospitals. It reduced need to administer anesthetic as now less than 2% of children now required it. More successful scans, less reschedules. And in doing this, they also reduced the carbon footprint of the department. But Doug used design thinking to change his and his team's mindset. And in doing so, built a better experience for the children he was serving whilst driving better business results. And so to close, let me take you back to that video I shared right at the start, which was about our philosophy of design at IBM. And there are three things I leave you with. Firstly, that good design is not only a requirement, but a deep responsibility to the relationships we serve. And we've got to embed this culture of design and a designer's mindset across all of our organizations. Secondly, 
that the purpose of every design and every designer is to guide, to lead, to provoke, to provide and to progress and to move people emotionally and functionally forward. And finally, and most importantly, we've got to do this in a way that allows future generations to enjoy it. So look, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope I've made you think and I hope I've left you with something uh, to take back into your organisation. So at that point, I'm going to hand back over uh, to Stephanie. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you made us think. Look at my, I don't know if you're able to see. <laughs> I've been following you and it's time now to answer some questions from our audience. Uh, Marta asks, uh, she says, thank you very much, really inspiring. Do you think big, company, the big companies are in the mood of transforming their product model to be more sustainable? Are they demanding design thinking approaches to make a real change? What do you think? Yeah, so I, I don't think companies are doing enough on this at the moment. Um, and so... You know, certainly the work that we've been doing is to develop a, a set of methods and practices. So as we're thinking about that understanding phase where we're trying to understand user need in the design process, not only are we doing empathy mapping or looking at the as is journeys, you know, or stakeholder mapping, but we're building in sustainability goals. We're building in sustainability pledges, right? We're framing sustainability in that design and understanding phase. And I think companies have done, a you know, Many companies where their products or services are physical products or services, I think this has always been, you know, and is becoming a very important thing in the mindset of how they develop those physical products and supply chain, etc. But I, I, I think as we start thinking about the role that digital products and services can play um, in companies, then this becomes a really important thing to think through because a lot of it is going to be around driving and changing user behavior. You know, you saw in that example on the phone, uh, that I showed, right? This is around changing people's behavior and doing it in a very kind of subtle way, but also in a way that's adding value to their lives, but creates better outcomes for them and the planet. So lots more to do, lots more to do, I think. Of course. Um, and I have a question. You lead a global team of 17,000 people. What, what are the keys for, for you as a leader? What do you have to do? Uh, any inspiration you are able to share with us as a leader? <laughs> so I've had to get used to very long days on like WebEx and Teams and Zoom, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> being in one time zone where the rest of the world is not in that time zone is a challenge. Um, so I think, I mean, I mean my, job, my job is in some respects to be setting that vision and North Star um, and to be the chief cheerleader, actually, is how I look at my job as a leader, is to be the chief cheerleader for our people and to create the environment um, to allow them to come to work every day and do their best work. Um, we have some amazing you know, talents, designers, developers, data scientists, project managers, um, you know, architects around the world. Uh, and I think our job as leaders is very simply to create the environment to allow people to do their best work. Um, and I think their best work happens when we put them together and they come together in multidisciplinary teams. Um, and I think it happens when they see and feel the purpose for the work that they're doing and the outcomes. And, and I think that COVID actually has created over the last 18 months, a lot more focus uh, for people and teams on the purpose of what they're doing and the output and the impact that they have in their work. Um, thank you, Matthew. I know you think globally, of course, but is there any difference? So do you feel that there is any difference in the Spanish market? Because you mentioned culture. So how do you how do you see from IBM? How do you see us? Yeah, so I um so I, I haven't been to Spain for over 18 months now and I'm desperate to come. In fact, I'm taking my first business trip this week to France. So I'm slowly going to be leaving the shores of the UK. Um, I think in, in Spain, you know, every culture um, uh, around the world is, is different. And I think in Spain, I see a very passionate, um, a very passionate and energetic culture. And so I do think the role of design and design thinking, which is all about co-creation, collaboration, you know, how teams come together to think through problems and, you know, and build answers that are helping solve something for a human and taking friction out of their life. Right. And, and, and so and I think that passion and energy that I see 
um, you know, in, 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 in the Spanish people and in the Spanish market, I think makes this way of working using a design and a design driven approach, a very powerful technique um, for driving, for driving those outcomes. And you also have much better weather than we have here. In <laughs> so you're able to do a lot more of this stuff outside with mother nature, whereas here it just rains and is gray. <laughs> of course, there's something we cannot control. <laughs> and my last question before we, we leave, um, you have worked uh, for IBM for your whole career. Did you expect so many changes in the market when you started years ago? Yeah. So I've, I've been at IBM 24 years now, joined as a graduate, came up as a computer scientist and a developer, and I fell in love with this idea of design. I'm a technologist at heart, and I see the power and have experienced the power of this combination of art and science together. And, and, and I think to me, it has been, you know, over the last 10 years while I've been working in this part of the business, building this part of the business, to see this left brain and right brain kind of idea come together and the power of creativity and design combined with technology um, creates the most incredible impacts. And so, you know, we're a company where reinvention has always been within the DNA of our organization. And even when you think you've reinvented and transformed, you haven't because you've got to keep going and you've got to keep moving to the future. Um, and you've got to keep this um, this drumbeat of change going. And so, um, you know, it's kind of ingrained into the DNA and it's fun. And I think it it's what makes work and life fun. Otherwise, it would be very boring. No doubt. No doubt. Thank you very much, Matthew Candy, for being with us. Uh, for sharing your knowledge and your time with us today. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much for the invite and um, good luck with the rest of the event. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Safe, safe travels. Good trip. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs>